Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. So, we are going to start with the book of Romans, chapter 7. And it's basically like an expository study, because I believe Romans 7 and 8 is talking about spiritually minded versus um, carnally minded. And Paul's talking about his conversion from being lost to being saved when it comes to his way he sees things in his brain. You know, carnally minded versus spiritually minded. And just remember, the whole point of this study is, can a Christian be carnally minded? Now, when we get to Romans 8, the next chapter, Paul talks about that you can't be carnally minded. The Bible, uh, chapter 8, he says, to be carnally minded is death. To be carnally minded is enmity against God. So, verse, I decided to go ahead and do 7. Let's do it in order, because Paul's saying, this is what happened to me. This is what I went through. Okay? Then he goes to chapter 8 saying, there's no other way. Okay, basically he's saying you can't keep your old life and be saved. The old man's dead and buried. New man. The old bottle and the old wine get left behind and God gives you a new bottle that can be filled with new wine. Like we talked about in the intro study. So, Romans chapter 7, verse 1 through 4. Okay. Now ye... Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. Remember uh, Paul's background. He was, a, as the, he was part of the strictest sect of the Sadducees, and he knew the law. I wish I'd have wrote this down, but it's not focused mainly on this study, but he talks about all his training, all his teaching, everything. He counts it all but dumb. Right? Because he didn't know about Jesus Christ. Uh, that he knows the law. That's what he's saying. Know that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. People say, well, no, you get saved. It's a question mark. For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another Man, she shall be called an adulteress, but if her husband be dead, she is free from the law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Okay, what is this talking about? Let's see, one through four. Here, number four. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law, that's what he's comparing it to, dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. What is he saying here? The old, bear, the old wine, I don't want to say barrel, I keep slipping up the same barrel. The old bottle of wine, and the old wine, he's contrasting your old life, you're married to another man. The law of sin and death, as we get through this study. Okay? And when you get saved... That law of sin and death dies. The old man dies. You are resurrected as a new man. So the old husband dies, and now you're free to be married to a new man. This is all spiritually speaking. You're allowed, now you get the new bottle that God gives you, and the new wine. Now you're married to Jesus Christ, spiritually speaking. Okay? Because people in the lost world likes to take that the wrong way. Okay? That's what's going on here. So if you want to turn to 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11. Remember we talked about the carnal mind versus the spiritual mind. The old life. You walked in the flesh. The flesh controls you. Now you get saved. You're spiritually minded. You walk after the spirit and you put the flesh down. It's no longer in charge. Uh, 2 Corinthians 11, 1 through 4. And then 1 Corinthians. One through four. Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. One husband, not two. Okay. But I fear lest by any means 
So what's going on? Okay. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if, what's going on? This is the book of Corinthians, okay? For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, another husband, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which we have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. When we get to part three of this study, we're going to go through First and Second Corinthians. Okay, what's going on in First and Second Corinthians? You have wolves in sheep's clothing coming in. They're creating false converts, and the babes in Christ, the newly saved, the babes in Christ, they're messing up. What are they doing? They're coming in. They're preaching another Jesus. They're um, they're getting people to receive another spirit, not Jesus, not the Holy Spirit, another spirit, and because they're following another gospel. That's what's going on here. And Paul questions their salvation, saying, uh, I don't think you're saved. A lot of you guys are carnally minded. You're walking after the flesh. And after taking closer examination, this is Paul, closer examination, you're following another Jesus. You're not following the Jesus we preached to you when we first came. A lot, some of you don't have the Holy Spirit in you. Some of you are not following the gospel that we preached when we first came. He has to come to him and set the striker straight. That's what's going on here. But for what we're going through, he's saying here back in um, Romans chapter 7 that the old man was married to the law of sin and death. The world. But you had to get to the point where you come to God broken. That man dies. So now you are free. After salvation, when God saves you, you are free now to be married to Jesus Christ. You cannot keep the old man, the old husband, and say, I'm Christian. I'm married to Jesus Christ. What is that? Fornication. Adultery. The old man has to die for the new man to come into your life. Okay. So that's what's going on there. So we talked about... Uh, 2 Corinthians 11, 1 through 4, I left this part out. For it says, for if he, so who's the he? I mentioned it. I believe that's false. Uh, wolves in sheep's clothing are coming in. They're creating false converts. And what do false converts do? They create more false converts. Okay? Being deceiving and being deceived. Okay? Who's the he there in verse 4? For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus. False converts. Wolves in sheep's clothing. Okay? And notice it says another spirit, because we're talking about, for this study, we're talking about being spiritually minded and walking after the spirit. So, 1 John 4, 1. Let's go to 1 John 4, 1. Uh, 1 John 4, verse 1. Beloved... This is the thing. This is why they get on to us real quick. They get on to us who are truly saved, saying, you can't judge me. How dare you judge me? Okay? What's going on in 1 and 2 Corinthians? Another spirit. They're receiving another spirit. You have false converts. And what do false converts do? They come in and they mess things up. So let's get this straight real quick. 1 and 2 Corinthians, I believe, by Scripture, what you're dealing with, what Paul is dealing with, is babes in Christ... And false converts. What's Satan's plan that he's been using all the time in the church, what I call the church age? He creates, he gets people to worship a false Jesus, receive a different spirit, his spirit, you know, devils, demons, uh, whatever you want to call it, but it's a different, the Antichrist spirit that's in the world today, okay, and gets them to worship a false gospel. So his goals are two things today. He knows he's lost, okay, he's not going to win. So he's going to keep as many people from getting saved as possible. And then those who are saved, the second part is, he's going to mess them up as much as possible. That's what's going on in First and Second Corinthians. Then you get over to Galatians, what's happening there? More false converts are coming in. And they're trying to prevent people from getting saved. 
telling them they have to go back under the law to be saved. And those that aren't saved, that get saved at that point, thinking they have to keep the law to be saved. And those that are truly saved, what are they doing? They're messing them up. The twofold purpose that Satan does. Prevent people from getting saved and messing up those who are. Okay. So, they get on to us saying, uh, you can't judge whether someone's saved. These false converts are coming in and they're messing Christians up. So how do you prevent that? Okay, 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world, wolves in sheep's clothing. Hereby know ye the Spirit, capital S, Spirit of God, even the Spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that Spirit of God. Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already it is in the world. So we go out to these false converts and we say, hey, the Jesus you're professing, the Antichrist. You have an Antichrist spirit. And we try to teach them about the real Jesus Christ, and true conversion, you go from carnally minded to spiritually minded. There's a changed life. That changed life is evidence of repentance, fruit meat for repentance. That changed life is evidence that you are now spiritually minded. Capital S Spirit. Holy Spirit minded. You have the Holy Spirit in you. The, your conscience bears witness with your Holy Spirit. He tells you what to do and you do it. It's that simple. And when you do it the Lord, uh, that the Lord tells you through His perfect written word, your life is going to change. Okay? And when there's no changed life, what does that mean? You're carnally minded. You're still walking after the flesh. Oh, you can do that and be saved. Uh, no, you can't. Like I said, when we get to chapter 8, it explains Paul saying, no, you can't. But chapter 7 is his conversion. So, uh, James 4.4, 4, if you want to go to that one. Um, some of these I have memorized, praise the Lord. Some I should have memorized, and I'm still working on it. But James 4.4. 4, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore shall be a friend of the world is enmity with God. Why does it say adulterers and adulteresses? What did we just read here? You're espoused to one husband. When you try to go when you try to keep the world and be a friend of the world, you're trying to keep that old husband. The world's way is sin and death. Wages of sin is death. The law of sin and death. Okay? You're not to be a friend of the world. You can't have two husbands. It doesn't work that way. So, when you're trying to be a friend of the world, you're trying to keep your old husband, for what we're talking about, and you can't have the new one. You're the enemy of God. The adulterers, adulterers. Is enemy with God. Whosoever that shall be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Okay? You can't be the enemy of God and be saved. You can't keep that old bottle and the old wine and say, hey, I'm saved. You can't pretend in your head that you've got the new wine. You can't dress that bottle up, no matter how much you try to dress that bottle up to make it look new and counterfeit the new bottle of wine. It won't ever be the new bottle of wine. Okay? Uh, 1 John 2.15 Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You can't be saved and not have the love of the Father in you. Okay? Uh, are you, basically, if you're in love with the first husband, the world, okay, the love of the Father is not in you. You can't serve two masters, if you remember that verse. Okay. You'll either love one and hate the other, or cleave to the other and hate the one. You can't serve two masters. You can't have two husbands. Okay. That's what's going on. That's what Paul's talking about here. That when you get saved, the old husband dies. And when he dies, because of the law being fulfilled, Jesus fulfilled the law, now you're free to be married to another husband. Until you come to the Lord broken, 
saying, I'm a dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner on my way to hell, and Lord, I deserve to go to hell for sinning against you. I'm so sorry, Lord, for sinning against you. What do I do? When you get to that broken point, that truly broken state, I believe the old husband dies. And you turn to Jesus Christ. Lord, save me. Only you can save me. Jesus, I believe in what you did on the cross. I believe in the death, burial, and resurrection. That it was God, capital G, God's blood, that was shed on the cross to pay for my sins and wash my sins away. Only you can save me. Now you're married to the new husband. You see what's going on here? That's what's going on here. <laughs> um, a few more verses before we get back to Romans. Uh, 2 Corinthians 13, 1 through 6. Or, yeah, 2 Corinthians. Back to 2 Corinthians. You'll notice that we go, through, go to Corinthians a lot. 2 Corinthians 13, 1 through 6. And you wonder why. I already told what's going on here. 2 Corinthians 13. I have to keep saying it for myself because I start forgetting where we're trying to go. Because I have a lot of Corinthians up here. 2 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 6. Now notice what he's saying here. This is the third time I am coming to you. It's almost like for a lot of those people, they reject the true gospel. They love their Jesus. They love having another spirit. They love the other gospel. It's okay with their sin. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. I told you before and foretell you as if I were present the second time and being absent now I write to them which therefore have sinned and to all others that if I come again I will not spare. Since ye seek a proof of Christ speaking in me which to you word is not weak but is mighty in you. For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God towards us, toward you. Examine yourselves. Okay. Examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobate. Okay, Jesus in you, the new husband. But notice he's saying this is the third time he's coming, and he's still doubting some of their salvations. Okay, examine where, whether he be in the faith. And here's the key word, too, that a lot of those false converts don't like. And I'm not hammering you guys if you're a false convert and watching this, okay? I'm hoping this opens your eyes to what's really going on. This right here says, prove your own selves. You're going to prove that you have the Holy Spirit in you. How do you do that? You're spiritually minded and you walk after the Spirit. There's a changed life. You stand for the real Jesus Christ that has a zero tolerance for sin. Okay? You have the Holy Spirit in you, not another spirit. You stand for the true gospel of Jesus Christ. You don't go for this worldly gospel that says you can have the world and be saved. Worship this Antichrist posing as Jesus Christ that's okay with sin. It's not that big of a deal. You can keep the old bottle. You can keep the old wine. Mark chapter 2 it was where uh, Jesus is talking about how you can't put uh, new wine in old bottles. That's what's going on. And they're still struggling even after the third time Paul's writing to them. Okay. Verse 6. We're going to go all the way to verse 6. But I trust that ye shall know that we are not reprobates. Remember what we read earlier about another Jesus, which we, Paul's talking about himself and those that are with him, that we have not preached. Or you receive another spirit that we have not received. Paul's saying, we have the Holy Spirit. What spirit do you have in you? He's actually questioning him. What spirit do you have in you? Or another gospel which we haven't preached. Okay? Paul is still doubting their salvation even at the end of Corinthians. And all through Corinthians, he's correcting them. Saying, hey, these are evidence. You're supposed to prove your own selves. There is no, well, how dare you, how dare you question my salvation? How dare you question my salvation? 
Um, we're supposed to do that. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits. Why? Because false converts are going to come in and they're going to mess you up. You start looking online, hey, this teacher says some good things, you know, pleasing to the ear. Try to, there's a verse out there that talks about how they speak flattery, they have pleasing to the ear. So, um, it sounds good. And then they'll ask us, do you th I've been asked before, do you think this person's good? And the first thing I ask is, what Bible do they use? Second thing I ask is, what gospel do they preach and stand for? And then you start going down the line, what about dispensational teaching? Do they believe in dispensation? Do they believe in 2 Timothy 2.15, rightly dividing the word of truth? Do they believe in eternal security? Do they believe in pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away the body of Christ? Do they believe in the true Godhead? They might be using Trinity terms because it's the traditions of men. The people in the past did it, so we have to do it today. But when you set them down and actually talk to them, do they believe in the, or look at them and listen to them, do they actually believe the Godhead over the Trinity? If they're off in any of these areas, stay away from them. It's that simple. Okay. Why? Because they're going to come in and they're going to mess you up. That's what's going on in First and Second Corinthians. It's not about saying can a, car, a Christian can be carnal. You can be carnal and be a Christian. It's about are you carnally minded? Okay. Uh, one more verse before we go back to Romans. Matthew 23. Matthew 23. Maybe I should pick it up and just flip it like <laughs> it'd be faster. Uh, Matthew 23:13-15. Now this is what happens because, like I said, we're talking about false converts. We're talking about evidence of false converts is they're they're not spiritually minded. Okay, they're carnally minded, and because they're carnally minded, they walk after the flesh. And if you want to justify the old wine and the old bottle, if you want to justify it, how do you do it? You've got to make Jesus conform to you. You've got to make a Jesus that conforms to you. You've got to make God's Word conform to you. A lot of the world, the most of the professing Christians of the world, they use the Bible perversion. Excuse me. They don't want God's perfect written Word. And I've always said this before, I believe that false converts are more dangerous than someone who flat out rejects Jesus Christ. I want nothing to do with them. I'm an atheist. I'm a Buddhist. Whatever. Those people are not as dangerous as someone who professes to be saved. Who professes to follow a Jesus. Okay. So 14. Woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer, therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Okay. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Now I'm not saying that if you're one of these false converts out there, you can't get saved. Okay, But once you reject the true Jesus Christ, you're now a child of disobedience, and you're basically choosing the world, and the Jesus you worship is Satan. Deceiving and being deceived. What's going on? They're trying to get you to stay married to the old husband. That the lost world, these false converts, are trying to keep you from being married to the new husband. They want you to keep the old husband. Because he's great. The old husband is, is okay with sin. He's okay with all the styles and fashions out there. He's cool. Uh, he gets to be called a homeboy. The big guy upstairs. You don't have to respect him. You don't have to give him glory in all things. You don't have to pray. It's just all about you. Me, 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 I, I, I. This Jesus lets you be all about you. Feelings and opinions, what you want. Jesus conforms to you. God's Word conforms to you. Okay? So, going back to... If we can... Romans, chapter 7...
Romans chapter 7. So that's what's going 1 through 4. He's explaining that the old husband has to die for you to have the new husband. The old man has to be dead and buried in order for, the, for you to have the new man, to be a new creature in Christ Jesus. So Romans chapter 7 verse 5. For when we were in the flesh, past tense, the motion of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. Okay. Key there, like I, like I emphasized, we were in the flesh. To, in the Bible, you'll look, when you read the Bible, there's two types of in the flesh. There's in the flesh as far as we have this body, this physical body that's going to tempt you when you're saved. Uh, you need sleep. The body's going to want more sleep sometimes, or the body won't give you enough. The body doesn't give you enough sleep. Um, food. Uh, you need the body likes the bad food. The body likes to eat more food. This is just common stuff. But also the the body, the flesh likes things that please the flesh. Okay. In the flesh, though, oftentimes they're just talking about the physical body. Jesus Christ was manif or God was manifest in the flesh. It's just talking about the flesh. Then the other way is we're in the flesh, it's talking about walking in the flesh, I believe. Okay? That's why it says were, past tense. Okay? The law of sin and death, lost or about the physical body. Those are the two contrasts there. What is the evidence of fruit unto death? Okay? When we get into verse 8, it explains it more. Okay? The carnal mind, to be carnally... Um, to be carnally minded is death, is what it says in verse 8. What does it say here? Fourth fruit uh, unto death. Verse 4, we talked about that we should bring forth fruit unto God, the new husband. The new man in Christ Jesus, you're going to bring forth fruit unto God. When you're lost, you're going to have forth, bring forth fruit unto death. Okay. Carnal mind, walking after the flesh versus walk, having a spiritual mind, which we get taught, we're going to be talking about in verse 8. You know what I'm saying? Um, walking after the spirit. You're going to struggle with the flesh, but you're not going to, the flesh isn't going to run you. And you're not going to walk in the flesh. You're going to struggle with it. Okay? Bad, dead fruit. I want to say this real quick. Looking it up, I was like, well... I've heard of rotten fruit. As a Christian, you can have some rotten fruit. And because you're going to do things, I'm, I'm the chiefest of sinners. I've made mistakes in my life, but God has cleaned it up. Do I still make mistakes? Oh yeah, I made a huge one recently. Okay? You can still make mistakes. Okay? But what is dead fruit? Okay? Dead fruit is fruit that has no virtue, no vitamins, or substance that makes it valuable. The old bottle is worthless. It's that simple. Dead fruit. What's a good example of dead fruit? I'm thinking it's talking about, you know that fruit that's not edible? It's poison. No vitamins. No substance that makes it valuable. You have certain fruit out there you're not to eat. You have certain fruit out there that you're not to have really anything to do with it. Okay, It's just worthless. It might still look good, it's like uh, around here we have, there were some berries growing that look, they look like um, blackberries, uh, but they're red. And they look like some of the salmon berries, because there's red salmon berries that will go red, because I think it's cross-pollination. And some of them are yellowish, um, yellowish gold. Okay, that's the picture of uh, some of the salmon berries that are here. But there's these red berries, you are not to eat them. They look like uh, was it wild? Um, I can't think of the name, but basically they look this, like a berry you can eat, but you can't eat it. Okay, you're not supposed to bring forth fruit unto death. That's the mark of a false convert. You're supposed to bring fruit unto God. So what's this thing about fruit unto death versus fruit unto God? Matthew seven fifteen. Matthew chapter 7, 
verse 15 through 23. Okay. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You're going to start seeing the contrast in the study. Like I said, you're really it's going to open your eyes when we get to 1st and 2nd Corinthians. But what's really going on here with this whole thing about trying to stand for a carnal Christian? You can be a carnal Christian. What they're really saying is, is you can be carnally minded, walk in the flesh. You can have this world, keep the old bottle, keep the old wine, be married to the old man, and then claim you're a Christian. That's what it's all about. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gra gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. So throughout the Bible, you've learned that there's four types of fruit. This will be a good, might be a good study. There's four types of fruit. You can have dead fruit. You can have evil fruit. You can have um, a good fruit, those three, but I can't remember if it mentions fruit that's gone bad. Um, my brain kind of freezes sometimes in certain words. Uh, fruit that's gone bad, um, but we know those three types of fruit are mentioned. Dead fruit, evil fruit, and uh, good fruit. Another way to explain it is... The evil fruit are all these false converts. It just talks about we wear false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. That's talking about evil fruit. Over here, it's talking about the contrast between lost and saved. The lost and false converts have dead fruit. And if you're truly saved, you're going to have good fruit. Okay. Verse 18. We're going to go to 23. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. You can be deceived. I understand that when you're newly saved, First and Second Corinthians, the book of Galatians, they can get messed up because people are coming in and deceiving them. But they're still going to have good fruit in their life. God's going to set them straight, even if it's by chastening of the Lord. God will set you straight, even if it means sending somebody to you, like Paul coming to him the third time, sending someone to you to correct you and set it straight, set the record straight. Okay, This is how you're not supposed to be doing that. This is how you're supposed to be living. That's not how you're supposed to be living. You're supposed to have good fruit. I hardly see any fruit, good fruit in you. You need to have a lot of good fruit. Okay. Verse 19, Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Okay. If you have dead fruit, where are you going to wind up? Hell. And then toss in the lake of fire. Because who has dead fruit? The lost world. Evil fruit. Where are you going to end up? All these people, and I, I believe that people who stand up and try to get into ministry and they start preaching another Jesus and another gospel uh, and, and telling people to follow another spirit, the Antichrist spirit, and when you sit down and you talk to them about the truth, they might have been deceived, they might be going off the traditions of men, they were raised in this type of building, they were raised under this type of belief, but when you sit down with them and you talk with them and they reject absolute truth, they reject the King James Bible, uh, God's going to hold them to a higher standard. But where are they going to wind up? In hell to burn and then toss in the lake of fire for all eternity. Both of them will end up there if they continue to reject Jesus Christ. If they die in their sins. Verse 20. Wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. <coughs> That's called judging again. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits. All these false converts are coming in trying to teach another spirit, another Jesus, another gospel. Verse 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Bad fruit, evil fruit, but they profess to know Jesus Christ. They don't know thee, Jesus Christ. Okay, I never knew you. Why? Because you're worshiping Satan as the Antichrist. That Antichrist spirit that's here. Okay. That's what's going on. Okay. Over here in 7, uh, verse 5, uh, good fruit versus bad fruit. You're going to want good fruit. 
You're going to desire to have good fruit. You're going to want to please God. Why? Because the old husband's dead. You're married to the new husband. The old man is dead. You're now a new creature in Christ Jesus. What does that mean, the new creature in Christ Jesus? It means that you're spiritually minded, and you're going to walk after the Spirit, and you're going to put the flesh down. The flesh, before you're saved, is in charge. You're carnally minded, you walk after the flesh, the flesh is in charge. You come to God broken, God saves you, and now your flesh is no longer in charge. God's Holy Spirit is in charge. God is in charge. And when your flesh starts to fall into sin and starts trying to resurrect the old man, God chastens you to get you back on the right track. But there's going to be good fruit. Okay, Titus 1.16. If you want to turn to Titus 1.16. Rotten food. <laughs> Rotten fruit. That's the one I was thinking about. Rotten fruit. I have to... I didn't look at that, so I'll look in there and see if rotten fruit's in there. Um, but Titus 1.16. 1.16. Uh, sorry, Titus is a small book. It's easy to pass it on accident. Titus 1, verse 16. Now over here we talked about fruit unto death. Titus 1.16 They profess that they know God. Let's go back to 15. Unto the pure all things are pure. Good fruit. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. You have the evil fruit and you've got the dead fruit. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. Okay, remember we talked about it. Their mind is carnally minded. Their flesh is about walking after the flesh. Okay, that's what runs them. That's what their life is about: pleasing the flesh, pleasing me, myself, and I. Okay, what kind of people are these? Sixteen. When it comes to false converts, they profess that they know God. What did we read over in Matthew? I never knew you. They profess that they know God. But in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work, reprobate. Okay? Abominable, you know, like dead fruit and evil fruit are to the Lord. Disobedient, they don't want to obey the gospel. They love their Jesus. They love the Antichrist spirit. And they try to claim it's the real Jesus, it's the Holy Ghost, and they're, we're following the true gospel. And unto every good work, reprobate. Their fruit is dead. Okay? And some of the teachers, their fruit is evil and dead. So, uh, as we see there, going back to uh, Romans chapter 7, it talks about dead fruit versus fruit unto God. Okay? Fruit unto God is good fruit. So, back to Romans chapter 7, we're going to do, we're on 6 through 8. Six to eight. But now we are delivered from the law. Delivered. Okay. That being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Spiritually minded is what happens when you get saved. So you were carnally minded, you were under the law of sin and death, but now you're not. Okay? But now are you delivered from the law? And who delivered us from the law? Jesus Christ. Verse 7, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Verse 8, But sin, taken occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. Okay, making sure. Concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. Okay. Bottom line, what he's saying here is the law is a good thing. Why? Uh, new, verse 6 talks about newness of spirit versus the oldness of the letter. Newness of spirit, capital S, spirit, talking about the Holy Ghost. The old man doesn't have the, the newness of the spirit. Okay. The oldness of the letter. Talking about the old man, the old the law of sin and death. 
Okay? Um, the wages of sin is death. What's going to happen? If you sin against God, you're worthy of hell. The punishment, which is hell. All right? Now, verse 8, concupiscence. I can't even pronounce that sometimes. Concup, concupiscence. Uh, what does it say? Lust. The definition. Lust, unlawful or regular desire of sexual pleasure. In a more general sense, the coveting of carnal things. There's our word carnal. Or an irregular appetite for worldly good. Like goods of the world, worldly good. Inclination for unlawful enjoyments. Okay? That's what concupiscence is. Verse 8, But sin taken occasion by the commandment wrought me all manner of concupiscence. Uh, the law, I hope I'm not jumping ahead, but the law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. That's why it's a good thing. It's supposed to point you at Jesus Christ. Um, Galatians 3, 24 through 25. That's the one I jumped ahead. <laughs> but turn to Galatians. Okay, what's happening in Galatians? They're being told they have to go under the law to be saved. And what's the law all about? Teaching you that you can't be saved. I mean, you can't save yourself with the law is supposed to teach you that you're a sinner, you can't save yourself, and the wages of sin is death, the cost of sin is hell. Okay? You can't be perfect. Only a perfect person can go to heaven. And when you get saved, Jesus' righteousness is, is imputed to you. I'm not perfect because of me. Okay? God looks at me as being perfect because Jesus' righteousness is imputed to me. God's uh, Jesus' blood, capital G, God's blood, wash my sins away. So Galatians 3.24 Galatians 3.24 Let's start at 23. But before faith came, we were kept under the law. Shut up unto faith, which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. So, as we read there, what does it mean to be under a schoolmaster? Uh, the, law, uh, the law of God opposed to the law of sin and death. Under a schoolmaster... The law of sin and death. The schoolmaster is someone, it's the law telling you you're a sinner. You can't keep the law. That's why it's there to prove that you can't keep it. So what does it mean not to be under a schoolmaster? Okay? You're no longer about the law of sin and death after you get saved. You're about the law of God. Jesus came and fulfilled the law. He didn't come to take it away. So when you're reading there, it's easy for, if you go, you know, scripture, you're not longer under a schoolmaster. For you are all the children of God. So who are you under now? God. Jesus Christ. By the faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? We do not need to be told we are sinners, which is what the schoolmaster does. When you're saved, I am a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. I don't need to be told I'm a sinner. When you're lost, they, when you preach the gospel to the lost, you've got to tell them they're sinners. The law is a schoolmaster for it, uh, to bring you to Christ. We tell them they're your sinners because that's what the law says. Now, the, we talked about the Galatians were being deceived into keeping the law to be saved. You had to keep the law to be saved. And it's not possible to keep the law. False converts are coming in, trying to tell, teach them a false gospel. Oh yeah, you believe in Jesus Christ, but you also have to keep the law. Okay? Now, does that mean we can sin all we want? Notice how it says uh, we're not under a schoolmaster. Okay. Does that mean, the question just popped up in my head when I was doing a study, does that mean we can sin all we want? Romans 6.15. Go back to Romans 6, verse 15. What then shall we, what then? We're going to be going all the way to 18. What then shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. That's the biggest thing that's going on with a lot of these people that like to stand for being a carnal Christian. Carnality. Okay, we're under grace. So that justifies our sin. 
Uh, no, God forbid. Know ye not that whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey? The flesh isn't supposed to be in charge anymore. The old man, the carnal mind, walking in the flesh, uh, you're worshiping a false Jesus and you have an antichrist spirit. You're a servant ye of whom uh, ye obey. You're not supposed to be servants of the flesh. Whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. Either your flesh is in charge or Jesus is in charge. Mm -hmm. Verse 17, But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, were, once again past tense, the servant of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye become the servants of righteousness. It always comes down to the heart. I've always preached that. It comes down to the heart. Repentance happens in the heart. Belief happens in the heart. Coming to God broken happens in the heart. All right. And notice how it says, let's see, it's in Romans. Let's see if I can quote this properly. Because like I said, I'm trying to memorize scripture. But I always have a problem with the address. And I'm trying to work on that. I can quote a lot of scriptures, but I have a problem with the address sometimes. But with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. But with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. With the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. What does it say here? From that heart, that form of doctrine which was delivered to you, being then made free from sin, you become the servants of righteousness. You're going to walk, you're going to have a newness of mind. You're going to have a spiritual mind, capital S, spiritually minded, and you're going to walk after the spirit. The flesh is no longer, you're not serving the flesh anymore. Okay? The law was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, but it doesn't judge now that we're saved and God's grace is on us. That doesn't justify sin. That doesn't justify people sitting there saying, oh, you can be a carnal, you can be so carnal, so wicked, and so sinful and still be saved. What does the Bible say? The carnal mind, to be carnally minded is death. That's in the book of Romans chapter 8. Uh, carnally minded is enmity against God. Can you be carnal, Christian, Christian, and your life is just messed up left and right? Just totally wicked and full of sin, and you just justify sin, it's not that big of a deal. Okay, it's just your opinion, it depends on how you look at it, that's your interpretation. I feel this, my opinion's this. You're dealing with somebody who's carnally minded, not spiritually minded. So, um, go back to Romans chapter 7, we're in... Verse 8. We did verse 8. I'm sorry. Verse 9. Remember in verse 8 where it says, For without the law sin was dead. Because that also applies to what we're going to read in verse 9. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Now what confused me when I read all this is, yeah, it talks about eternal security. People can use it for eternal security, instruction and righteousness, your struggles with the sin after you're saved. Because like I said, you're no longer a servant of, of the flesh. You're no longer the servant of sin. You're the servant of God. But as I'm reading this, it also f it makes me feel, and was confusing, because some of, when we get through it, some of the things that are being said, it's almost like Paul's talking about his mindset. From the day he was born to the day he got saved and how his mindset's supposed to be after he's saved. That's what it feels like it's going on here. So it's not talking about somebody who's a, just, it's not always talking about someone who's saved, but it's talking about that process about your mindset. So what is 9 and the last part of verse 8? For without the law, sin was death. Okay. Romans 5.13. Turn back to Romans 5.13. For, un for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. What's Paul talking about right here? For I was alive without the law once. He's alive. Okay. Remember, uh, we get when we get saved, we're made alive. When we're lost, we're dead. But Paul's saying, for I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. He's talking about being a child. When he was a child, he was innocent. Where there is no law, sin was dead. I'm not, he's, a child's not held accountable to the law because they're innocent. 
They don't know they've sinned against God. They can't understand the, the gravity, if you want to say, of what it means to sin against God. So Paul started at the beginning of his life when he was born. Uh, uh, Romans 7.10 Let me read 10 to 14. And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. What does that mean? I feel when you talk about this and you think about Paul, I feel, when you think about Paul's life, <laughs> I shouldn't have used that word, when you look at scripture and you look at Paul's life, he's a strictest sect of the Pharisees, he's about keeping the law and obeying the law. So as we read here, I was adorned, the, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. Some people in the Old Testament, and even today, believe that the law is there to keep you to be a good person, so you can be a good person. You can live life right, that's what the law is there for, you know. Uh, then Paul finds out, no, it's to prove that I'm a sinner. Mm -hmm. It's not ordained to life, it's to let me know I'm dead. I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. Okay. Once again, the law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. It is good, it is just, it is holy. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid, but sin that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly, exceeding sinful. Okay. Verse 10 and 11, we said, Paul up, thought that the law was to tell you how to live. You know, people, some people I've come across uh, that tell you the Bible is just a guide. It's just a guideline to help you live a good life. So you can have a good life. and I mean, be a good person. Uh, no, uh, that's what Paul thought. It was a, the, the, the Ten Commandments was not a guide, but you, that's what you had to do to have a good life and be a good person. Okay. But it was to show, I see, the law is to show that you are a sinner. Verse 13 is talking about becoming broken. This was pretty interesting. The law shows us that we are dead in trespasses and sin. Notice it says here uh, that the sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. Okay? You talk to these lost people and they're like, well, I know I'm a sinner. You're a sinner, we're all sinners. But when you come to God broken, that's when you look at your life and see how exceeding sinful it is. It's just wicked. I'm no good. Chiefest of sinners. There's none righteous. Oh, we're going to get to that verse. Oh, wretched man that I am. Okay? What's going on here? The laws to the schoolmaster bring you to Christ to let you know just how wicked and sinful you truly are. Uh, Galatians 2, 10, uh, 20 to 21. Remember Galatians is about people trying to be brought under the law. So Galatians 2, 20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Okay, once again. Righteousness doesn't come by the law, it comes by Jesus Christ. The law is to tell you that you're not righteous. You're sinful, you're wicked. Um, and when you get crucified with Christ, Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, right there you can see the word in the flesh, it's talking about this body, it's not redeemed, we're having to live in this world. In the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Okay, flesh is going to fight you absolutely, but you're not going to walk in the flesh. But the point there is that the righteousness comes from Jesus Christ, not the law. The law is there to tell you that you're a sinner, and that's what I believe is going on here. Okay, he's saying I once I figured this out when he realized the law is not there to uh, tell you how good of a person you can be and how you can you know earn salvation, earn righteousness, or be righteous. 
It was there to tell you you're not righteous. Um, once again, you find out how filthy and wicked your life is. Uh, Romans 7.15, back to Romans. Did I forget to read 14? Yes, I did. Exceeding sinful. I got, got to the point where I want to tell you about exceeding sinful. But 14, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I'm carnal, sold under sin. There's our word carnal. See, he's carnal, he's carnal. He's sold under sin. What does that mean? Um, people, I always tell people, when it comes to telling the lost world that Jesus' present tense paid for their sins, like I said, I'm still trying to work this out through Scripture. But what I keep seeing that's getting to me is my mortgage for this house. If somebody goes to the bank and pays my mortgage off and comes to me and say, Jesus goes and pays that mortgage off, the title, the proof that I own this house, comes to me in the mail. This house is mine now. And then Jesus comes to me and says, I need you to believe in me. What's the point? My house is paid. I'm good to go. Now the Bible doesn't teach that. What the Bible teaches is Jesus goes to the bank and says, I'm going to pay, I'll give you money for that debt. So the debt goes to Jesus in the sense that he's the person who holds the debt now. Then Jesus comes and says, hey, you owe me the debt now that you can't pay. You can't pay it. And that's the biggest thing for me. Uh, telling the lost world that Jesus, past tense, paid for the sins of the world. He paid for all the sins of the world. The debt went to him. The debt that you owe, you owe God the Father, which you couldn't pay, and you owe the law, and you're going to go to hell. Now, you owe Jesus Christ. You want your debt paid? You want your sins washed away? You have to go to Jesus Christ. You reject Jesus Christ, you'll be paying for your sins at the great white throne. The debt that you owe Jesus Christ, that's why he's on the throne judging. That and he's capital G God. God fully and completely. So I am carnal, sold under sin. My house actually is past the mortgage. The, the, the loan itself has changed hands several times, I've noticed with my house. But um, you're sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. Now we start going into 15 through 22. That which I do I allow not. For that I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that is good. Now what's it talking about here? The law that which is good. The law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Okay? You've got to come to God broken. You have to get to that point where you understand that that I... I do that which I would not. Okay. Verse 17, Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Like I said, there's certain passages here that I read, and it's like, uh, when you're saved, that's right. Uh, your flesh and your soul are the spiritual circumcision that's made with hands. Your flesh is not connected to your soul anymore. So it's no longer your soul that's sinning, it's your flesh. Verse 18, For I know that it is in me, that is, my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Notice he says that it is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. And I came across this verse and I got to thinking, um, I'm supposed to go to 22, okay. I got to thinking, it says, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. But when you get saved, you have the Holy Spirit in you. The Holy Spirit guides you in all truth. We have God's perfect written word. That's how we find out how to do, um, to perform that which is good. But when you're lost, you can't do that. They don't have the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, how can they perform that which is good? Verse 19, For the good that I would do not, but the eve, see, for, for the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. It's like he's going back and forth. His lost life, 
is saved life, his mindset. Okay? But I'm not saying that's exactly what it is. Like I said, when I read this, I know that we use it for instruction in righteousness, that as a sinner today, you're still a sinner. You're not going to be perfect. Not until the day that God catches his way, the catching away of the body of Christ. Um, verse 21, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Okay, I find then a law okay, present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. I'm talking about the law of God, so that's saved. Okay? The law of sin and death is not what he's talking about, he's talking about the law of God. After the inward man. The law of the spirit of life and peace, which is in Christ Jesus, when it talks about the inner man, because we're talking about the law. Sounds like Paul's showing us his mindset before he got saved and after he got saved. He's going back and forth trying to say, this is how I was before, this is how I am when I'm now. That's what I was before, this is how I am now. Okay? You still struggle with the flesh. Okay. Okay, verse 23. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Notice there it says law of sin. It doesn't say law of sin and death. So I read this, and there's, like I said, so much of it says it's talking about a saved person. But there's a few things in there that I go, well, for instruction, righteous, letting us know your mindset, it's supposed to, how it's supposed to be now versus how it is then. Okay, uh, before you get saved, because like I said, we started with his lost life as a child, his lost life when it comes to the law, supposed to be a schoolmaster to bring him to Christ, and now he's talking about his life, his mindset, now that he's saved. Mm -hmm. But like I said, a big important thing I saw there was the law of sin, and it doesn't say death. The law of sin and death. It's just the law of sin, which is in my members. Okay. There is now, after salvation, a war between the mind and the flesh. That's the law of sin he's talking about. Your flesh is still going to be sinful. It's going to still want to sin. Okay? But remember, it's not in charge. When you were lost, the carnal mind and walking after the flesh, they were in sync. Your mind and your flesh were in sync. There was no war. Now that you're saved, after salvation, there's a war. Why is that? Because you're no longer carnally minded. You're spiritually minded. You walk after the Spirit. That struggle needs to be there. That war needs to be there. And when we see these people that just vehemently stand for you, you can just be so wicked, evil and sinful, and carnal, as they like to say, and still be saved, where's the war? There's no war. That person isn't saved. There's supposed to be a war. Okay. That's what this is talking about. Okay, the captivity of my mind, the law of my mind, warring the law of mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin. There's times that your flesh is going to try to get you to sin. There's some times that you're going to drop your cross. Remember, deny yourself, pick up your cross daily, and follow me. It's talking about Jesus. Repent, forsake, and move on. Get back to where you left off with your walk with the Lord. That's a process that's going to happen your whole life as a saved sinner. It's going to happen, but there has to be that war. Where's the war at? There's no war, you're not saved. Okay. And we're going to get to that point. So, like I said, you were, you were, you were in sync when you're lost, you're not in sync when you're saved. Remember what that means. Your brain, uh, fleshly, minded is in sync with the flesh. You walk in the flesh. Now your mind is spiritually minded and your flesh wants to still walk in, after the flesh. But you put it down because you have the Holy Spirit and you end up walking in the Spirit. But there's that war. You're no longer in sync. Your mind's not in sync with the flesh. Okay? Your mind wants to please God. Your flesh wants to please itself. So, Romans 7, 24, 25, last two verses. Because here's what's going on. There's a lot, there's a war going on. How can I win this war? It's not just, Paul's not just saying there's a war going on and then he leaves it at that. What does he stop with? 24. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, 
but with the flesh, the law of sin. Once again, it doesn't say sin and death. But I was looking at this going, when I was going down, it's talking about different periods in Paul's life, his mindset. When he was a child, he didn't know he was a sinner. Then, when he came to the age of accountability, sin revived and he died. Now he knows he's a sinner. Then he talks about how he has to come to the Lord broken. He starts seeing the sin in his life, how he's no good. He even talks about when he was lost, that sin, the law, it, it was just there to help you be a good person, to be in right standing with the Lord, to prove that you can be righteous. And that's not what the law is for. He had to come broken and realize, that's not what the law is for. The law is to bring me to Christ. The schoolmaster to bring me to Christ. It's to let me know that I'm a sinner. So when I was reading through this, I was like, you know what? This is almost like the gospel. Now hear me out. I mean, Paul's saying what he went through. So when he says, O wretched man that I am, the way, if you notice that passage, it has an exclamation point. He's not just saying, well, I'm a wretched man. You're a wretched man. We're all wretched men and women. You know, you're a sinner. I'm a sinner. We're all sinners. It's an exclamation point. O wretched man that I am. Repentance. True biblical repentance, godly sorrow for sinning against him. He's saying, I'm a wretched man. I'm no good. Okay. Who will deliver me from this body of this death? What's the wages of sin? Death. Hell and a need for a Savior, because he's saying, who will deliver me? Okay. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Then my mind, I might serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. What is that? The changed life after salvation. Doesn't it kind of look like that when you're reading it and you're trying to apply it to Paul's going from being lost to being saved? People say, Paul never repented. Paul never repented. Oh, wretched man that I am. He talks about his lost life, the state of his mind, how he viewed sin when he was lost versus to how he views sin when he's saved. A rich man that I am, they said, well, he didn't ask God to save them. Who will deliver me from this body of death, this death? I need to be saved. Who's going to save me? God. God saved me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay? So I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I'm just saying that was pretty interesting when I was reading that. But bottom line for this study you cannot be carnally minded and be saved. Paul talks about you were that way. Now you're not. The old life is supposed to be dead. You're supposed to have a new life. You're supposed to keep the flesh down now. That leads to the changed life. Spiritually minded, walking in the spirit. So, we're going to get into the next part, which is Romans chapter 8, where, where Paul really sticks in saying, No. You can't be your old man and be saved. You can't be carnally minded and walk after the flesh and be saved. Okay? You are struggling with the flesh, the war of the flesh. The law of sin says that this flesh is sinful and wicked. And it is. Someone once said that we are two-thirds redeemed. I heard it from somebody who heard it from somebody. It was a great thing that God showed that person. Two-thirds redeemed. Our soul is redeemed and our spirit's redeemed, but this body of flesh is not redeemed. We're waiting for the catching away of the body of Christ for our bodies to be redeemed. So, the dead in Christ will rise first, and that we which remain, we go up, those who are alive, and get to see the catching away of the body of Christ, to be here at that uh, time. So, yeah. We're going to go to verse 8 in the next part of the study. So thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next study.